Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Raven. Our guest today is Dr. Casey Lynn Thompson. Uh, she is an, an associate professor of business ethics, business, and strategy at Ferris State University in Michigan, state where I grew up. So before I tell you more, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. How are you today? I'm doing really well. Um, awesome. I don't miss I don't miss the Michigan winners. Uh, well, it's plenty of snow here. In the event you do miss it, um, I have plenty of snow outside for you right <laughs> you can, now. You can send me snow. <laughs> like so literally, like shoveling myself out of the driveway today. So yeah, yeah. And uh, this might be a mistake, but you know, in Michigan, we always point to where we're, where we are. Ferris State University. Is yeah, up in the, a little, the, yeah. the northern middle part of the lower peninsula. So right about there, maybe a little, yes, right about there. Hit <laughs> Sorry. it. You Sorry got it. <laughs> and I could drive straight to it based on the little mitten. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And the people who are just listening, I realize me holding up a hand does nothing for the podcast listeners. So <laughs> my mistake. But again, Dr. Casey Lynn Thompson, um, she is the former director of global menu strategy for a Fortune 250 company. She is the author of a book titled Fall Down, Gritty Up, The Unconventional Mental Map for Becoming Your Own Hero. Um, she is the proprietor of Pendulum Publishing, uh, a consulting firm in Michigan. She earned her PhD in values-driven leadership from Benedictine University. So you can learn more about her at her website, drcaseylynn.com. Uh, Casey with a K, there'll be a link in the show notes so you don't make a mistake with the name. Um, so with that, you know, the different things you've done in your professional life, what is your favorite mistake? Well, when I think about my favorite, so I have many, <laughs> quite a few um, I could talk about, but my favorite probably would have happened when I was uh, earlier in my career. And I was at a really pivotal point in my career where I wasn't necessarily the most junior person on the team, but I definitely, by far, I didn't have as much experience as everyone else. And I was at a national uh, advertising and marketing agency. And um, we had worked for many blue chip clients and McDonald's Corporation being one of them. And at the time, McDonald's owned Redbox mm -hmm. and it was a part of McDonald's Ventures. And the Redbox was a new enterprise because if you remember, Mark, and it wasn't so long ago, mm -hmm. um, but for the guests, and uh, if you can recall, you know, we had Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, and there were all of these brick and mortar places where you went to go and get DVDs or VHS, VHS tapes, actually, at the time, too. So to have this new innovation, like a big red box that just would appear at various locations and would spit out a DVD and... <laughs> You could return it anywhere. It just wasn't a sexy project for the team. Uh, the team that I worked on was just, they were high achievers and, you know, Ivy Leaguers and, you know, just really big school, uh, B, uh, grad school, B school students. And, you know, they just didn't find that project that exciting. So, of course, I got it. Um, uh, just given the, my position on the team. And they said, you know what? We got this new project, Redbox. Go for it. You know, figure it out. We don't know what it is. You know, if it's not something that, you know, is going to be viable, we'll put you on another account. Well, needless to say, I worked on a strategy for Redbox and no one had heard of it at this time, but just a very few, maybe a hundred people or more uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, McDonald's at the time was really impressed with the strategy that I wrote for how to launch this thing, I'm going to call it. And they asked if I wanted to come over and transition from, you know, an advertising agency to McDonald's corporation full time. So, of course, I'm going to jump at that as an opportunity. So that wasn't the mistake. Yeah. So fast forward a few months, I'm working with a really small team of people who I loved, Mark. I have to say, I think we did just grow a love for each other. We were vibrant and just innovators. And we were sort of in like this think tank where we could do whatever we wanted to do in launching this new product. And, um, Cat to the point where Redbox launched, it had a little bit of momentum, but McDonald's had decided at that time to sort of spin off all of its, you know, ancillary brands. So sure. Chipotle and Donato's and Boston Market and Redbox was one of those brands. And, you know, I, I was given the opportunity 
to either stay with Redbox once they spun them off and sold them, or I could, you know, we called it the mother, the mothership. I mm-hmm. could come over to the mothership, uh, to the mother brand, McDonald's Corporation, and just, you know, continue to work with them full time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, McDonald's was massive. It just felt like such an awesome opportunity. It was shiny and beautiful mm-hmm. and all of those things. And, well, I decided to leave Redbox and go over to McDonald's to a team of people who I never met. I didn't know. But it seemed like the best opportunity at the time. Needless to say, you know, maybe uh, six months to a year end, I'm having to reprove and re- and 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 you know, sort of show everyone, you know, what I can do. And while at Redbox, it was a bunch of really smart people. It was maybe twelve of us moving over to McDonald's, where there's thousands of really smart people, um, was a bit intimidating. A lot of the projects were a bit intimidating. It wasn't as fun, if I can just be Mm -hmm. really transparent with you at the time. It felt as if it was incredibly, just because of the way it's set up, it felt incredibly just difficult to navigate this huge ship. And, you know, there were many sleepless nights, Mark, where I sat back and was like, I know most people in that position would have jumped at the opportunity to have a great career at McDonald's Corporation. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was a really big mistake to leave Redbox mm-hmm. and to leave, you know, someplace that I loved, that I felt loved me. Mm-hmm. It kind of fed into all the things that drive me, entrepreneurship and challenges and risks and all of those things. And being small and nimble, it actually was this environment that I thrived in. To leave that and go somewhere just because of the name and the brand, it just felt like a really big mistake. Mm. And it, it sounds like it, it it took some time, that six months or that 12 months for that to sort of reveal itself of that, that huh. mistake or that regret. Yeah, I'm being generous, right? Yeah. I'm being generous because, you know, you give yourself many opportunities to say, well, you know, it was only a couple of weeks or it's only a couple of months. but if I'm going to be completely transparent, I probably knew really early on Mm -hmm. uh, within the first couple of weeks that, wow, this is an incredibly huge transition from the environment that I had just fallen in love with. Well, I I can imagine when you're going through that, you've, you've made this shift, uh, you know, kind of more of a startup culture to one of the world's largest companies, um, a different type of product, a different, um, maybe, maybe different culture. Yeah. You got that sense of, Oh, I wonder if this was a mistake. Like there's, there's this balance, this thing we fight through of like, do I see it through? Maybe it gets better or right. oh, it's a mistake. What, what, right. Was there some struggle that we're, you know, you're, you're trying to make it work. I'm sure. Well, you're going to make it work. Um, or at least I was determined to make it work because it was a phenomenal opportunity. And I think that was sort of the conundrum I was in is that I knew, you know, undoubtedly it was a phenomenal opportunity. It's one of the world's best companies. It's, it's an incredible company to work for. So that opportunity I knew was, you know, few and far in between. So I felt really thankful to be there, but at the same time, when you have sort of this love, you know, kind of environment for, or love for a a past environment, that that was my kind of rub. It's like, I know this is a great opportunity. I know it, but I can't help but kind of long for the sort of inclusiveness and the smallness and the nimbleness of the team that I just left. Knowing that I just left because of, you know, the massive nature of McDonald's Corporation. Yeah. And you, I, I saw from your bio, um, I thought this was an interesting detail. You earned your PhD without McDonald's knowing you were working on it. That, yeah. That's an so, unusual detail. Well, um, when you think about corporate America in general, so not even just McDonald's, um, the, the, there's a value in getting your MBA or, you know, that next level degree in business. But once you kind of 
pursue a PhD, there's not a lot of applicability to that Mm -hmm. um, because it is, you know, so theoretical and based in philosophy and that sort of thing. Um, There's not a lot of value um, that's really seen in in getting that level of education. And that's just across any corporate environment. So that's nothing new. Um, So when I first entered the program, I did it apprehensively because, or I was apprehensive in talking about it. Mm. Because I knew just given the environment, it would already start to, you know, question, well, why? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's you say you're going to get your MBA. It's like, oh, yeah, of course you say, well, I I think I'm going to pursue a Ph.D., then the question marks start to, you know, kind of circulate around the room Mm -hmm. and the speculation of, so why would you do that? You know, what Mm -hmm. value would that be bringing? And at that time, just given the complexity of the PhD program, I just didn't want, you know, to add on yet another layer of stress or another layer of conversation. I thought that I could be much more swift um, for that first part of my education if I just did it and did it on my own. I ultimately told them uh, near the end, Mm -hmm. but I was much further along in the program, almost ready to graduate at that point. (laughs) And I had already accumulated so many gray hairs. People knew something was going on. So I may as well have told them. So I just said it. Yeah. So and then they thought, well, all right, Casey plans on she's probably going to be leaving us. And I mean, well, that was sort of part of your plan was to, to then go into the academic, academic world, start teaching. Yeah. That was always part of my plan. Yeah. And Mark, people ask me, you know, well, when did you know, or what was there sort of this moment um, that something happened that kind of caused you to want to move into academia? It is so strange, but I've always known that. Like I've always had this desire to become a professor. And, you know, it was just a matter of timing and a matter of experience. And when I felt as if I was ready to start that next level. So yeah, once I started talking about it, I think, you know, it was pretty immediate. People knew that something else was suit, like that next shoe was about to drop. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I, I kind of held them off just a little bit in talking about academia. But after a while, you can't, you know, avoid the conversation. I may as well bring you all, you know, along with this journey with me. Yeah. So I want to come back in, in a little bit and talk about some of the things you're, you're teaching about and doing research on. But I'm thinking about your story and that decision point of, of um, leaving Redbox, going to McDonald's and um, the, the, the learning that you've gotten from that. I imagine there, there are students now who talk to you about career directions types of companies, or maybe they have a couple of job offers. I mean, do, do you find that the, the, the insights that you've gotten from that experience um, help you coach or advise students? Absolutely. So yeah. from uh, multiple perspectives. So if I'm speaking to a student, you know, of course you want them to um, accept the best opportunity, but the best opportunity is relative. Uh, And that's the one conversation that I want to make sure that, you know, I have with them and that, you know, it could be the biggest, the best, the the strongest or, or, you know, the most profitable brand. But it could also be that upstart or it could also be that, you know, mom, pa or that local, you know, type of, of, of brand or business. It's really about understanding who you are first. And that's the way I sort of counsel and mentor uh, students is first identify what are those things that motivate you? What are those things that truly inspire you? What are those things that, you know, kind of get you up and going uh, at, at the start of your day? What are those things that make you happy? I mean, clearly you're younger and you're kind of discovering, but just based on what you know, um, and then apply the jobs after that. But Before you go and say yes, especially if you have multiple offers, first, understand what it is that drives you. And then from there, make a much more insightful decision versus just, you know, kind of just jumping at not just the first, but just jumping at an opportunity just because it it appears to be so. Yeah. And, And there's maybe a part of your story that reminds students, if you end up making a mistake in choosing a job that sometimes opens up other doors and there's learning and opportunities to recover from a mistake. I mean, maybe 
I so agree with that because while I'm telling this story um, and I'm just being really open about, you know, some of my internal struggles during that time, Mm -hmm. Mark, it was the best decision I could have ever made. Mm -hmm. The opportunities that I had um, while I was there were, they were not, they are, they're not replicable. Um, I've launched so many products for that brand, um, developed so many uh, standards and strategies for that brand. I would have never gotten that experience had I even stayed at Redbox for that matter. Um, And while Redbox may have offered me, you know, a greater sort of sense of being at that time, McDonald's opened me up to parts of my just, you know, uh, 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 skills and talents that I didn't even realize that I probably had at the time. And it challenged me in a way that I may be sharper in areas that I may have never even, you know, paid much more attention to had I not had the opportunities there. So at the time, did it feel like the biggest mistake, Mark? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But now I realize that without that, and even without that feeling, right? I wouldn't even be able to mentor the way that I mentor Mm -hmm. now. So I just accept it. And I'm really, really excited that, you know, I went through that. um, And even that period of self-doubt. Yeah. It's been beneficial to me. Well, and I think that's what makes it a favorite mistake that Mm -hmm. that when when you have that recognition uh, after some time has passed that, yeah, something good came out of that. Um, One just random question going back to when. Redbox was launching. I mean, that that was in a time, a place in time when Netflix was still mailing DVDs to the world, yes. right? Yep. It was a yep. different environment. Yes. And that's what, and I think that's what was so invigorating to be on that team is because there's not many opportunities you have, you know, within a lifetime to be sort of at the epitome of, of innovation. So you have Netflix in one, you know, corner and they're ready to, you know, fight and you're ready for the, the bell to ring and they're running to the middle of the, the mat and they're mailing DVDs and then they're dabbling a little bit in streaming. And right. then in the other corner, you have the brick and mortars who are like, we're not going anywhere. So they're fighting. And then you have this automated DVD system that's just a big red box that's popping up. So there's just not many times in history that you can be sort of in this area to watch innovations emerge, Mm -hmm. as well as, you know, industry leaders sort of like subside. So it was just like a really interesting, fun time that I'm thankful to have been a part of, but You know, it's just something that I can talk about for the rest of my career, Mm because I I don't think anything like that will probably ever happen again. Yeah. And Redbox has survived. I still see them outside of uh, a Walgreens and and different places. And they have gotten into streaming. So they've they've done some things right uh, to to survive with the shift to streaming that really started happening probably a couple of years after that launch. Yeah, but it's still interesting to watch that fight, um, the way that Netflix kind of, and we don't want to get too deep into this, but the way that okay. they kind of found their their standing and uh, emerged as the industry leader in that area. And while Redbox still has some opportunities, you know, I, I yeah, you look back and you're saying, well, you guys are still in there. You're still in the fight. Yeah. So that still makes me proud. Yeah, we're good. So I, I want to ask about your PhD work and, and, and talk about some of the things that you're teaching today. A PhD in values-driven leadership, like it's a really interesting phrase. How, how do you define that? What makes it values-based or values-driven leadership? Yeah. So when I actually started the exploration into PhD programs, of course, I went to a just much more traditional business route. And then I found this one program at Benedictine University that focused on the ethical components of leadership. It's still within the business, uh, the business realm, but business leadership in the respect of how do you lead corporations? How do you lead companies? How do you lead any level of industry, government, et cetera, from the most ethical with the greatest level of integrity? And with the most sound value system possible. And, you know, I grew up in a very religious type of environment. 
And, you know, my, I, I don't think anyone would have been surprised had I gone to like a theology school or went mm-hmm. that route. Um, and this values driven leadership within a business context was probably the closest thing to a secular business, traditional, you know, PhD, but yeah. just with a little bit of a, a halo of goodness. Mm-hmm. Right. And for me personally, you know, I, I teach as you, as you said, I, I teach business on a daily basis. And the one component that, you know, is just gravely missing in a lot of business programs, you know, while we talk and tout integrity, but to teach from the perspective of integrity is a little bit different. And um, that's what really drew me to the PhD program. And quite frankly, that's the position that I teach from uh, just even in a, a day-to-day capacity. Yeah. And having been in the news recently, at the risk of putting you on the spot around this, but I'm sure this is a a case you followed or students ask you about, um, the recent conviction of Elizabeth Holmes with Theranos. Yes. Was she consciously misleading people or was she a true believer in this technology vision that just wasn't there yet Mm -hmm. as that played out in the courtroom? Do, do Do you have a certain lens for looking at her story? Yeah, so true believer, and and you can look at it as you just positioned it in both ways. Um, Being a true believer is a a necessary, you know, it's a necessary component in innovation. If you don't truly believe in whatever this product or service or whatever it is that you're trying to develop and innovate, it's for not. So it won't be successful. But as a portion or as a part or the undergirth, right? Um, What should support that true belief is a transparency and an honesty, not only with yourself, but to anyone who has a vested interest in what it is that you're developing. So the passion I am 100% in support of, because you aren't going to be successful without it. However, there is a level of, as I said, transparency, there's a level of integrity, there's a level of just being honest in and of yourself. And not to say that the the honesty, you know, will have any detriment to your belief. I'm still going to believe, but you still have to to lay the cards out and allow other people to, to gain that same level of confidence based on accurate and real information and not just based on the fact that you believe so strongly. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I can lead you and I can and, and, and I can engage you to believe and to be excited but I want you to do that on your own accord based on the facts. And if you can meet me where I am, you know, let's go. But I don't want you there just because I'm the one that's telling you and just because I believe. And I think that's the part where the integrity just falls apart in her case. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're, you're teaching students and thinking about a, a, you know, a round of people, uh, um, a cohort of people who are going to go and start businesses or work for corporations of, of different sizes. But what, what are some of the most likely business ethics situations that they might face? Oh, there are so many, um, I'm countless, right? Um, but I, I think the one thing that, you know, from an ethics perspective that I try to make sure that all of my students uh, keep in mind is that first they need to be honest with themselves um, and honest and transparent in the information that they provide, not only to their immediate teams, to their bosses, if they have any interface with customers. I think the one thing that probably is just so incredibly detrimental in business right now is just the lack of transparency and the lack of honesty. And I know honesty just sounds like a rudimentary concept, but it isn't in business. Because when you look at social media or you look at so many things that are happening around us, there's always this veil of, you know, something other than what truly is behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we can just be upfront, the more that we can just confront issues, the sooner they arise, the more that we can just be honest in saying we made a mistake or we made the wrong assumption or this is how things truly are. It just it it eradicates so much cleanup work on the back end. I think so many of us go into business believing that, you know what, I have enough time to clear it up. 
you know, that's a concept called proximity of effect um, Mm -hmm. uh, or temporal immediacy. I'm sorry, temporal immediacy, where you feel as if you got enough time to, if I do make a little bit of a fudge, I can go back and correct it. It, There's always enough time. There isn't, right? Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't rely on that, that, that factor. We should just be as upfront and honest as possible, as soon as possible, so that we can start the rectification and start the correction process. Otherwise, it's just going to be much more um, uh, difficult and tedious the longer we let things just continue to go. Yeah. So your um, entrepreneurial streak um, is, um, I guess, uh, an example of your entrepreneurial um, streak is a restaurant. That you started there in Big Rapids, Michigan. This is a fun name. I want to say Fatty C's Doghouse. Um, Tell tell us about the restaurant. First off, the name. I'm curious the name and and what led you to do that. So, um, and when I accepted the professorship at Ferris State University, it's a small college town and, you know, you, you want to satiating food sometimes. We all try. I try to eat as healthy as possible, but sometimes you just want a great burger, a great steak, a great whatever. And um, one thing that I was just missing was flavor profiles from back at home. And, you know, I'm from right right outside of Chicago. I was born and raised in Gary, Indiana, but lived in the Chicago suburbs almost my entire career. And we just had the best Polishes and Mm -hmm. hot dogs and chicken fingers, all of those late night foods that just kind of get you through whatever it is you're going through. Right. So I was missing that flavor profile. So my husband and I came here and He's also from the area. And we said, you know what? We're going to bring that flavor to Big Rapids. So we have a small, it's a takeout restaurant reminiscent of the restaurants that are back at home. Mm -hmm. Anyone's from Chicago knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, You go in, you get some really good grub uh, and you head on your way. And uh, the name Fatty C's. So my husband's nickname for his mom is Fatty. He called, he's called her that her entire okay. life has nothing to do with size. You got to be careful. Has nothing to do yeah. with it. Um, but it's a name that he's called her since he was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And my mom's name is Carol. So Fatty C's doghouse is in honor of both of our moms. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and everyone just seems to have gravitated to it. It's stuck. So we stayed with it. So it looks like I, I'm just browsing through the menu here and good thing I'm not hungry or it's going to make me hungry. You. Looking at the Chicago dogs and oh, yes. uh, all, all kinds of great stuff here. Now in, nor- in normal times um, seems perfectly geared uh, to late night college students, maybe mm. on their way home from a, a night out. Oh yes. <laughs> is oh, it a yeah. late night place in normal times? So it is because of the pandemic and COVID, um, we've had to restrict our hours like so many places. The intent and where we will be back soon is absolutely late night. So when you get that late night munchie, you know exactly where you're going to go. So, yes. Go to Fatty C's Doghouse. And um, I mean, it's it's an opportunity as a, a business professor to to put ideas into practice and kind of show to to your students you you were you were saying earlier this idea of going getting a phd is very theoretical and now you know you're you're doing something very very practical and tangible mm-hmm. with the Absolutely. restaurant and that's what I do. You know, I talk to my students all the time. I, I, I walk the walk. Right. So I just don't you know, sit in, in, in lecture for hours upon hours. Uh, I want to show you a practical application of everything that we talk about. And I teach from a practical application because I was a practitioner for the majority of my career. So I have almost all college students who work for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I have 20 year old twins. So they're there managing. Um, I have three or four different uh, students from the College of Business, a couple of high school students. But that was the premise is I saw just a lack of practical experience that students were getting. So they come through and and I have a full staff of students there to welcome customers. But I teach them not just you're not you're not just coming in here, you know, clocking in with a job. I am preparing you. Mm-hmm. you know, for your careers when you leave here. So they're studying management and operations and project management. Yeah. I am throwing them things where they're like, wait, wait, wait a minute. I thought I was just working to register. I'm like, no, no, no. We're we're learning. This is a continuum mm-hmm. from what we talked about in class today. So no, it's been great. It's been yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, like running a register is um, customer service and learning how 
um, to, to resolve situations. If somebody's unhappy, that's a whole education in and of itself. Absolutely. I'm sure yes. just as one example. Yes. It's funny you just said that because one of my students, um, she's probably the youngest that we have and the most shy. And I had her on customer service just the other day and she was answering the phone and she would put her hand over the phone and was like, they asked me this. Tell them, talk to them, take your hand off that phone and answer those questions. You've been here. This is your restaurant, you know. And when she hung up and she was just like, oh, I was so, ex- you know, so nervous. And so this is training ground. And there are no, well, there are mistakes, but any mistakes that are made, we're going to learn from them here. So no, and, and she thanked me and all of that afterwards, but it's just watching them blossom from the mistakes that they don't know that I get excited and I get all, you know, kind of teary eyed when I see them, them. kind of, yeah. I get so proud seeing them grow, but that that's part of it, right? Just, yeah. just watching them grow. So it sounds like, um, it, you know, you, you rave about the food and that's important, but it sounds like there are some values in the business that, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, that you're focused on as, as you've absolutely. touched on anything else that comes to mind. Like I love it when I go to a restaurant sometimes, like if it's a local business and you see some sort of statement of mm-hmm. values or principles, like a plaque or some sort of sign, mm-hmm. I hope they're living by it, right? Yeah. You hope it's not yeah. just a, a poster on the wall, but you can sense when, there's a good dynamic of people enjoy working at a place when there's a a good culture, a good spirit about it. Mm -hmm. And even from our customers, I can't tell you how many times customers have walked in there and before they left, they'll call me to the window and they're like, you know what? I'm so happy I came in here. I feel so much better. Or I was so upset or I was sad or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. I am just happy I came in here. And that's what we say to everyone. I don't care what your affiliations are, what what your belief system. I don't care about any of that. Leave it at the door because when you come in here, we're going to laugh. We're going to talk. We're going to be friends. And this is a safe zone for everyone. And Mark, I have to tell you, 99.9% we have fulfilled that promise to our customers. A mm-hmm. couple people who, you know, kind of, I think they're even shocked that we're that transparent, like, no, 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 check it at the door. Come on in here and smile. Um, so I have to force the smile out of a couple people, but 99.9% just give it back to me without me forcing. So yeah, that's very cool. It's been um, awesome. So I, again, I want to ask about um, the book before we go. Again, our guest is um, Dr. Casey Lynn Thompson. Uh, the book is Fall Down, Gritty Up, The Unconventional Mental Map for Becoming Your Own Hero. Um, so, so I'd like to ask about the names, uh, the restaurant and, and the book here. It's not Giddy Up, it's Gritty Up. Hopefully gritty. I'm enunciating yes, that yes. clearly yes. enough. So what? tell us about that phrase, Gritty Up, Gritty Up. Well, the phase is just accepting the fact that, and it, we're talking about mistakes on your show. The, the book is all about really my mistakes um, and how I learned to embrace every single mistake uh, that I experienced. And before I, you know, allow myself to get too down or question too much, I, I, I sit back and try to figure out, so what am I learning from this? What am I getting from this? How am I growing from this? So I don't have to keep going through this again. So the whole concept of gritty up is that at any point in our lives, we can find ourselves up against, you know, an obstacle. You know what? Gritty up, get it together. We're going to figure it out and we're going to keep going. And we're not going to let that obstacle or the next obstacle that will inevitably come. We're not going to let that one get in our way either. So It's just embracing the fact that you'll have great days. You'll have some not so great days, but you are strong and you're stronger than what you realize. And you're going to gritty up and you're going to get through it. And I kind of share a lot of my experiences, not only in corporate, my personal experiences, me growing up, you know, my my parental kind of dynamics, that sort of thing, and use that as an inspiration and use that as sort of a tool for other people to say, you know what? And I mean this, and I know it's so cliche, but if she can do it, if she got through it, so can you. And that's, and that is my message. You can absolutely get through it. Yeah. It requires some resilience. And is, is that something can we learn to be more resilient or we just keep working at it? If that's something we focus on. 
Yeah. So resilience is, it's a, it, talk about a continuum. Resilience is a never ending journey and you're tested and you're, you, you become more resilient, you know, with every, every situation with every test. So, you know, yes, we are resilient. It's just the manner in which, you know, to what degree are we just going to accept the fact that there'll always be something. So you don't even think about resilience in that term anymore, or you don't think about it sort of empowering. It just, it just is, it's just the way that we operate. Um, so yeah, so that it, it's, it's a continuing continuous theme throughout the book. Well, I hope people will go check it out again, fall down gritty up. You can find it for sure on Amazon and I'm sure other places. And um, Dr. Casey Lynn Thompson, you can find her website, drcaseylynn.com. Look for a link in the show. It's, a, it's been a real joy to talk to you. I appreciate you sharing the story and uh, the reflections and the lessons and talking about all the different things that you do. It's really, really fascinating. It's been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. <laughs>